All right. Hello, everybody. I know it has been quite some time since we did one of these, but we're going to go ahead today, and I'm coming in here for a new video, our first since, I believe, March, if I'm not wrong. Summer has just occupied my being and doing, so I have not really had the time to devote to the videos as I wished. So today I wanted to go ahead and come in and do one for the first time in a while, and something that is a little older than probably what we're used to. I was trying to, at the same time when I considered know what video I want to do next, I wanted to try to hit some history that maybe was a little further back than the 1500s at least. And this is something that I think is relevant to the modern day world. It's also very important to world history as it really marks a big division in religious matters. And it has had consequences ever since. So what we're going to talk about today is the Great Schism of 1054. Now, what the Great Schism is, is basically the separation between the Western Catholic Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Eastern Orthodox or Greek Orthodox, however you may pronounce it. At one time, we have to remember that when Christianity first started, the, there was only one church. There was only one church that existed in the world, and no matter where they were in Europe or the Middle East or Africa, they were a united church. But as we know of today, there are many different branches of churches. There are many different branches of Christianity that have come off from each other. Now, about a year or two ago, we talked about the Reformation in regards to the Protestant branches that kind of break off from the Catholic Church during the Reformation in the 1500s. This predates even that. Of course, we know that the Reformation, the Protestant branches like the Presbyterians, the Lutherans, the Calvinists, who, who else am I trying to think, the Baptists, they all kind of break off from the Catholic Church due to protests that they have over the Catholic Church's, poli not over its policies, but its rituals and its continual dealings and all, all kinds of stuff that they view the Catholic Church need to reform. That comes in the 1500s. This predates that when there is a split between the ideology a little bit of the church, and this causes a major split between mainly driven by the Pope in Rome. The Bishop of Rome is also more commonly known as the Pope, and the former Byzantine Empire's religious leaders, mainly the Patriarch of Constantinople, which to this day is still the head of the Orthodox Church. Back then, it was the Byzantine Empire or the Eastern Roman Empire, but we'll get into that. Because, so today's going to be a little bit of a religious video, but also a little bit of a video into the continuation of Rome a little bit, because this plays a heavy part, as we must realize that when Rome, when the Roman Empire officially took in Christianity as, legal, as a legal religion and may, soon made it its official religion, it did a very big step in tr helping to spread Christianity throughout Europe. So the empire that had once discriminated against Christians, that had once persecuted and executed them without any kind of remorse, eventually becomes Christian itself. And this also helps in its survival and also helps to kind of further the cause of Christianity into lands it had not been able to get to before. So as always, we're going through our notes and we got occasional pictures here, not many today, because a lot of this is not really stuff that can be represented with images, in my opinion, that you shouldn't probably be able to look up on your own or they're just not that important enough to get a separate image. So, uh, first, if we're going to talk about how the Great Schism comes about in 1054, we have to go to almost a thousand years beforehand, to around the very first century CE. CE, AD, same thing. Appar I've always known it as AD, but apparently recent historians now call it anything that used to be AD, they're more commonly calling CE. So that is kind of a new thing that I'm starting to try to adjust into using when I'm using my history terms and dates. So we all know that the birth of Christianity comes about in the first century CE, occurring, which occurred during the rule of the Roman Empire over much of the Mediterranean. At this point, the Roman Empire is the dominant power in Europe. It's the dominant power in the Middle East, pretty much, at least toward the Mediterranean. And it's the dominant power in North Africa. Rome has carved out a massive empire for itself by, this, by the time of Jesus. It is in control of Judea, the land of Israel. 
And of course, if you're a Christian, you probably don't need me to lecture you on who Jesus was. Of course, Jesus is seen by Christians to be the Son of God. He is seen to be the the Messiah. I'm 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 sorry to stumble on that, but he is seen as the Messiah by Christians. He's seen as he is come to save humanity from their sins. And we all know the story of Jesus, where he is born in a, in a manger. He is his mother is a virgin. She never had a man to help conceive Jesus. It was conceived by God. God had, had miraculously had Jesus conceived and had Mary carry the child. Mary gave birth on what would, get, would become Christmas, and her husband Joseph agreed to take her as his wife, and he agreed to take Jesus on as his son, even though it wasn't really his son. As we all know, Jesus grows up. He begins preaching his message of forgiveness and mercy and kindness to others. He also preaches the repentance of sins, and he rapidly gains a following in, Jude in Roman Judea. Of course, this is to the detri detriment of the Jewish priests and the Jewish high, high priest Caiaphas, who of course view Jesus as a heretic because he's saying things that for thousands of years, the Jews have appeared to, and now he's saying you no longer have to do that. And they don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They believe that he's a heretic for saying so, that he is the Son of God, that he's the Messiah, that it's blasphemy. They eventually conspire to, with the Romans to arrest Jesus. They fakely try him and have him executed by crucifixion on the cross. And we all know that the Christians, the main belief in them is that they believe that Jesus, on the third day after his death, as after they buried him, he rose from the dead and was back alive. Now, that follows, basically, the whole promise of Christianity is the promise of eternal life through the belief in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Now, I am a Christian myself, so I know a lot of this already. I'm not trying to try to force religion on other people. I'm just informing, so don't get the view that I'm trying to force you to be a Christian or trying to directly state that, you know, and trying to impose things. But this is the basic thing of Christianity. Now, the Romans, at this time, the Romans are pagan. They're a pagan empire. They have many gods and goddesses. We have Jupiter, we have Mars, we have, who else do we have here? Venus. A lot of the planets, by coincidence, were named after Roman gods. <laughs> but, anyway, the Romans view the following that after Jesus' death, Christianity starts to take root in Judea, and it starts to gain, gather a large following due in large part to Jesus' 12 disciples. Well, 11 disciples at that point, because the 12th one was dead, because he betrayed. But due to Jesus' surviving disciples, Christianity begins to spread. And eventually, the Romans are convinced that this new religious sect is a threat to their authority, because it preaches basically something contrary to what they're akin to, and it's gathering such a large following, it's starting to worry the Roman officials that they could incite a rebellion. So the Romans, for many centuries, for the first few centuries of Christianity's existence, were actively persecuting, arresting, and executing any Christians that they could find. It was a persecuted religion. You could not be publicly Christian in the Roman Empire, usually, without having some kind of persecution towards you. And in Rome's mind... It was justified, because in their mind, Jesus was a criminal. He had been crucified, and that was a common punishment for criminals back in Rome at that time. So they viewed that Jesus was very much nothing more than a common criminal, and that this cult was following the prospects and war promises of a dead criminal that had been executed for good reason. Now, in the second century, Rome reaches the peak of its control in Europe. It stretches and rules almost all of continental Europe. It rules all of France, Spain, North Africa, the Mediterranean border of the Middle East, the Balkans, and Greece, Anatolia. It rules even the southern half of England. But this large size of Rome came to be a hindrance to the empire, as the large size made it very incontrollable to administer. It could not administer its immense size effectively, because it was so big. It had outgrown its population at some sorts in its jurisdiction. This eventually culminates in the 3rd century what is known as the Crisis of the 3rd century CE, where Rome actually, under the weight of civil wars, rebellions, famines, and invasions— from all corners of the empire, almost disintegrates. It almost collapses in and of itself due to its own weight. 
And this finally ends in 284 CE, when the new emperor Diocletian ended the crisis upon assuming the throne as emperor. And he restructures the government entirely. But the main factor that Diocletian sets up here, that it's important to remember him for, is that he realizes that the empire has nearly collapsed due to its immense size, and it has not had an effective administration system to deal with that size. So in an attempt to try to remedy that, he splits the empire into two administrative halves, a, w a west and an east. And what he also makes is that there will be a co emper two emperors. There will be co-emperors. There will be an emperor for the western half of the empire that will administer the western half, which would include Rome, the lands in France, the lands in Iberia and Spain. And then there will be an eastern emperor that is the equal to the western emperor who will rule the lands in Greece, Anatolia, Egypt, uh, Israel, the Judea. So there's now going to be two emperors, and there's an eastern and a western half of the empire. So this is what historians will often call the Western Roman Empire and the Eastern Roman Empire. And this comes about in the year 284. Now in 306 CE, Emperor Constantine I becomes Rome's first Christian emperor. And this is big, because at the, until at this point, Rome had been very much a persecutor of Christians, and for there to be an emperor that was Christian himself, that was a game changer. And Constantine officially legalizes Christianity during his reign at, over the Roman Empire. He officially makes Christianity a legalized religion. There will be no more persecution of it. It is a legal religion in this empire. Eventually, it grows such a following in the Roman Empire upon its legalization that the Romans actually ditch their old pagan religion, and they adopt Christianity as the official state religion during Constantine's reign. In 325, Constantine even invoked the first council of Nicaea. 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 I don't know how they pronounce this. I'm going to say Nicaea. Which produces the Nicaean Creed. And the Nicaean Creed is really fundamental to the basic form of Christianity in that it decrees that Jesus is divine and he is the co-eternal with God, or as some Christians would refer to God, they refer to him as the Father. That Jesus is up there with God, he is a divine being, and that he is the co-eternal with the Father. And this is a major theology that was adopted in 325 during the First Council of Nicaea with the council members and the Emperor Constantine I. And this has remained a primary theology in much of mainstream Christianity in some form or another, despite the many divisions that have happened since. Now, Constantine also has a major importance as he is the one that moves the capital of the Roman Empire, which sounds unheard of. For ever since its founding, the capital had been in Rome. Constantine, upon victory uh, over a rebellion that had taken place against him, decides to build a whole new capital for Rome, to start anew, and he calls it Nova Roma, the New Rome, on the remains of the ancient city of Byzant the Greek city of Byzantium, on the Straits of the Dardanelles, near the little, if we all know where that is, that is the little strait that connects the European part of Turkey and the Asian part of the country of Turkey. Basically, it's right that pivot point, one side you're on Europe, where the city is, and the other side is Asia. It's that little strait that connects the Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. Now, eventually, the city of New Rome, after Constantine's death, would acquire a new name in the memory of him, and it would be known forevermore as Constantinople. And Constantinople, at this point, is now the capital of the, the main capital of the whole empire, but it's also the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire. Now, Christianity was led at this time by four bishops within the, um, within the four major church cities within the empire. And it was led by the Bishop of Rome in the old imperial capital, which is the Pope. We also had the Bishop of Constantinople. We had the Bishop of Antioch. And we had the Bishop of Alexandria. Now, Antioch is near, I believe, Syria and Israel, and then Alexandria was in Egypt. Now, the Bishop of Rome, of course, he is the oldest of the bishops, and of course, this is the Pope. So, familiarize yourself with that. When we say the Bishop of Rome, we're meaning the Pope. In 476 CE, this comes as the critical year. 
After decades of decline, the Western Roman Empire had suffered many barbarian invasions. You could really question whether or not the people were barbarians, but it got constantly invaded by Gallic tribes, and if it's poor government, poor management. Eventually, in 476, the last Western Roman emperor, Romulus Augustulus, was deposed by the... I'm trying to think here. What was... I think... I'm trying to think of what tribe he was. No, it was not that. Uh, not Nostrogoth. Okay, we will forget what tribe it was. <laughs> But he gets deposed by a German chieftain, and thus ends the Western Roman Empire. In 476, the West is lost to the barbarians, and Rome is no more in the West. Rome is no longer the center of any empire. However, what most people will not know is that the Eastern Empire actually did not fall in 476. It managed to continue. And this is where why we say the Roman Empire didn't end in 476, because tech, in all technicality, Half of it still went on for another thousand years. The Eastern Roman Empire, or as we now call it, the Byzantine Empire, because of the distinct Greek Christian culture that it later would later adopt that differentiated it so much from its original Roman title, even though during their lifetime, the Byzantines, they never called themselves Byzantines. During their lifetime, the Byzantines, up until their dying day in 1453, called themselves Romans and their realm, Romania. They referred to themselves as Romans. The term Byzantine didn't come about until the Renaissance, nearly a hundred years after they had been destroyed. But anyway, the Eastern Roman Empire survives the fall of the West in 476, and it now considers itself to be the sole successor to the Roman Empire. Now, the East gradually becomes the cultural center of Europe, while the West is now in the hands of barbarian chieftains who have no culture or religion or organized religion or any kind of sophistication to their lives. The East is still this haven for cultural significance and cuisine and all kinds of stuff. It is the have, it is the cultural center of Europe. It has not fallen to the Dark Ages. It is still very much enlightened in a strong, intelligent state. Now. Eventually, as we mentioned, the more this makes the Eastern Empire more settled, settled near Greece and Turkey. They eventually they begin to drop their Latin tongues and they speak more Greek language than Latin. Greek eventually takes over Latin as the primary language, and they're now Christian. They're no longer pagan like the Ante Roman Empire of antiquity. So this changes. Now the Great Schism starts coming about shortly during about the first couple centuries in. And what we can start referring to is it starts really with the reconquest of the West by the Byzantines in the 6th century under Emperor Justinian I, ironically who shares somewhat of a name with me. <laughs> but Emperor Justinian, he succeeds at reconquering much of the former lands of the Western Roman Empire in an attempt to regain those lost territories in the 6th century. So this would be the 500 CE. And he succeeds at getting most of these lands back, and he even succeeds at reconquering Italy, and thus he brings Rome back into the hands of the empire. And thus, by bringing Rome back into the empire, he's brought the Pope back in. Now, the Pope had not been wiped out by the fall of the Western Roman Empire in 476. In fact, the Pope had done relatively well by getting along with the lo local Germanic tribes, and he actually managed to convert many of them to Christianity. So, the Pope had just been setting up, he'd been settling in a safe zone for a while. He wasn't in any danger. Now he's back under the hand of the Byzantine Emperor, and the Byzantine Emperor is seen as the god's authority on Earth, almost, in a way to the Byzantines. He's seen as divinely appointed by God, while the Pope is the god's moral authority. So you have this clash that's going to start taking place between the religious leaders and the Emperor in Constantinople, and the Pope, who over time is really going to want to start upping his own power for political needs. Now, that might not sound like what a Pope should do, and I'm not saying they do that today. But back then, they were basically the whole schism somewhat comes about. Half of it comes about because the Pope starts wanting more political power over rulers and sovereigns. And he kind of forces and extend, overextends his hand just as much as the patriarch and the emperor do. <laughs> Now, in the 7th century, the century after the reconquest of the West, the new religion of Islam emerges out of the deserts of Arabia. And we all know 
followers of Islam are known as Muslims. Now, Islam really takes root pretty quick in the Middle East. And in fact, the Arabs, after the, their founder Muhammad's death, they rapidly conquer many of the lands in the Middle East under their control and take many of them from the Byzantine Empire, including Egypt and Israel and much of eastern Anatolia, the part of Turkey, and most of North Africa. So they gain a lot of territory very quickly after they emerge as a new religion on the global stage. This leads to the loss of Alexandria and Antioch, where two of the four major churches are, as those cities are now in Muslim hands. So thus, they're no longer centers of Christianity. Now, Christendom has now only got two bishops leading it. It has the Bishop of Constantinople, who will be known as the Patriarch in the future, and we have the Pope, the Bishop of Rome. This all happens between 567 and 752. Now, for two centuries, though, the popes were kind of subordinate to the Byzantine emperors, as the Byzantine emperor, emperor kind of had a hand in selecting the next pope. It wasn't all the po it wasn't all the church's decision. The emperor actually had a hand in deciding who was going to get that next position as the new pope once the current pope had passed away or given up the post. And so, for about 200 years. The Pope was somewhat dependent on the Emperor, and this kind of comes to a change in the 8th century, and this is where the fraction, be the friction begins that would lead to the Great Schism in more depth. In the year 730 CE, Emperor Leo III forbid the worshipping of any religious images and icons, and he declared that anyone that was going to try to worship images and icons, that this was heresy. They were heretics, and they were guilty of blasphemy and could, po could be punished for it. And this became known as the iconoclasm debate, because as we all know, one of the Ten Commandments is, Thou shalt not worship any idols. You shall not worship any other gods but me. And to Emperor Leo, he took that if you're worshipping a picture or an image, that this might count as an idol. So he said, okay, these are banned. We can't do these anymore. Now, this idea of iconoclasm was actually opposed by the Pope and the Western Church, as they believed that there was nothing wrong with having a picture or an image to do use in worship worship services. They did not view, they did not have the same view as the emperor. And Leo, when the Pope deliberately came out and said, I'm not following this because I don't believe this is right, I believe it's okay, Leo tried to use military force to compel Pope Gregory III to adhere to the iconoclasm decree. Of course, this ended up failing, and he was condemned by the Pope for trying to forcibly make him do so because he's supposed to be God's moral authority on earth. And you're supposed to do what God says. Now, although iconoclasm starts to divide the Eastern and Western churches, it is still divided. It's not in two halves yet. This is not a separate church at this point, but you're starting to see the friction start to occur where the Pope is starting to resist the will of the Emperor, and the Emperor is not liking it. He's at this point used military force, and when that fails and the Pope condemns him, Leo confiscates many of the papal estates and puts them under the direct control of Constantinople to kind of punish and in his view, punish the Pope. In 751, it gets worse. As the Lombards, a Germanic people, come down and conquer most of northern Italy from the Byzantines. And they actually finish conquering this in 751, and the city of Rome is now under threat of being conquered by the Lombards, being taken from the Byzantines by the Lombards. Now, the Pope who is in, he's kind of like the head of Rome at this point, he's like the mayor pretty much, because he's the most important figure there. At this point, he's already kind of had struggles with the Byzantine emperor. He doesn't really trust the Byzantines, and his first go-to is not to go ask them for help, because then it would be seen that he's being reliant upon them. So instead of asking the Byzantines to come to his assistance to defend Rome, he asks the Franks, a Gallic people that had emerged up in now, what is now France, and what found the Kingdom of France. And the Franks are a Christian people, and they've been carving out their own empire up in the modern days, of, modern areas of France and Germany. And the Pope is very much on good terms with them, so he asked the Frankish King Pepin to come help defend Rome, come push the Lombards out, help protect the holy city of Rome. And 
The Pope appeals to the Frankish king, and Pepin readily agrees to the Pope's request, and he sends troops. And they he he and the Franks very quickly push the Lombards out of Italy and take back the lands that they had stolen from the Byzantines. Unfortunately, what happens here is the Byzantines were under the impression that, okay, the Pope might have ordered new help, but we'll get the lands back now that they're not out of Lombard hands anymore. Pepin angers the Byzantines by instead declaring that the lands that he has just retaken from the Lombards, he would not be returning to the Byzantine Emperor or the Byzantine Empire, that he would instead be gifting them to the Pope in the city of Rome, and that they would forever belong to the Pope. And this would form the foundation of the Papal States, which was a basically a small little kingdom ruled by the Pope that would exist up until the 1860s, 1870s in Italy, when Italy would get unified. So basically, now the Pope is in control of his own miniature little kingdom. And this angers the Byzantines, because now it's seen as the Pope is trying to form his own state within the Empire. Basically, rebellion. But they can't do nothing much, because he's the Pope. And by this point, the Pope had also already decreed that they were going to be selecting their next successors and not the emperor. The emperor was no longer having a hand in selecting the next pope. And so that we have this friction really starting to emerge between the pope and the emperor and the religious officials in Constantinople. The next breakthrough comes through <coughs> in 797. Now, keep in mind that as the two are starting to have these conflicts, the people in the West, like the Franks, are turning to the Pope for protection. They're turning to the Pope for guidance and religious leadership, while in the East, the Byzantines are, instead of looking at the Pope, who they're increasingly seeing as a rebellious you know, troublemaker, they're starting to refer more to the Patriarch in Constantinople as their religious guidance and leader. In 797, this marks the reign, of, the start of the reign of the Byzantine Empress Irene, which was very odd that a woman would ever come to rule back in those days, but she managed to do so, and she was a very fairly good empress. As she comes to be the Empress of Constantinople upon t sealing, taking the throne away from her son. In fact, she had his eyes gouged, gouged out. It was kind of Kind of gruesome. However, Irene attempts to ease the tensions that have developed between the Pope, the Western Church, and the Eastern Church by lifting the iconoclasm debate, temporarily at least, in an attempt to try to appease the Pope and say, okay, l listen, we're not going to ban the worship of images and icons anymore. It, that seems to be what kind of started this whole friction in the first place, so I'm going to go ahead and lift that. Let let's just be friends here. The Pope, instead, doesn't really take up what should have been an olive branch. What should what he should have seen as an olive branch by the East, he doesn't see one as such. And instead, he makes matters worse by, in the year 8, on Christmas Day of the year 800 CE, he names the Frankish king Charlemagne the new Emperor of Rome, Emperor of the Romans, on Christmas Day of 800. And this ticks off the Byzantines, because they're supposed to be the successors of the Roman Empire, not this pretender from the Franks. So what claim does he have to the imperial title? The Empress Irene is the successor to the title of Emperor of Rome. And the Pope claims that he has the authority to do this, and that the he has the authority to do this on the condition that, in his view, the title of Emperor of Rome is currently empty, and the Byzantines are pretty much like, what do you mean it's empty? We have an empress. And the Pope says that's the problem. A woman cannot rule. A woman cannot be the Emperor of Rome. So once Irene took the throne in the Pope's mind, that title was currently empty, and he simply gave Charlemagne a title that wasn't currently being used. So in the Pope's mind, he has done nothing wrong. He has simply gifted that title to, that vacant title to somebody in order to have it, while in the Byzantine's mind, this is treason. This is traitorous. I mean, we have an empress. And the Pope's saying, nope, she's a woman. She can't rule. She can't be emperor of Rome because she's a woman. This only ends up to worsen the relations between the East and West and further starts dividing the Eastern and Western churches. 
Now, we also have to admit here that while there's a lot of, a lot of political stuff going on that leads to the divide of the Great Schism of 1054, we have to look that there are some differences in theology that emerge. In the East, they base a lot of their Christian rites and practices off of Greek philosophy, given that they're in the Greek Hellenic areas that are heavily influenced by Greek culture. In the West, it's still pretty much based on Roman law and a lot of practices. The Western churches also add something to the Nikian Creed that really sets them different off from the East and kind of makes matters worse. The Western churches added that the Holy Spirit came from both the Father, God, and the Son, Jesus. That the Holy Spirit came from both. And they add this to the Nikian Creed. However, they do this without consulting the religious leaders in Constantinople and without consulting the emperor. Now, it's not to say that they might not have come to an agreement on this had it been done. But given that the Western churches, led by the Pope, did this on their own authority without any consultation whatsoever of their Eastern counterparts, this ticked off the Byzantines as they did not believe that the Holy Spirit came from both, of both from both the Father and the Son, that it only came from the Father as they believed. They also had different rites for Eucharist, which is one of the old festivals in relation to Passover, if I'm not wrong. I could, I could be wrong on that, but I believe that is what that is, because I've just not heard that term before, but I believe it's Passover, because it, during Passover, you're supposed to eat, well, not the Eucharist. I don't think it's the Eucharist. What is the Eucharist? I'm trying to think here. <laughs> Give me one second while I look up here what it is. <laughs> Because I want to make sure we have this right. I don't want to embarrass anybody. I'm already embarrassing myself as it is. <laughs> okay, the Eucharist is in commemoration of the Last Supper. So, the Last Supper what Jesus had with his disciples. That was my bad. So, that would be Good Friday. Well, yeah, it would be pretty much during the week of Good Friday. It wouldn't be Good Friday itself. But that Last Supper that Jesus had with his disciples where he reveals that one of them will betray him. And that he's a, that he knows he's about to die, but during because during that last supper, Jesus and his disciples ate bread and they drank wine, in which Jesus famously said that the bread is my this is my body and this is my blood. But during the Eucharist, rite, Eucharist rites were different for East and West. The Latin West used unleavened bread, which is bread that has not been raised with yeast. It has no yeast in it. And the West is probably right on the prospect that they use unleavened bread because at the time, it's very unlikely that Jesus would have had access to leavened bread, at least if it was not given from God, at least. If it was given from God, who knows? But... If it was bread they made themselves, odds are it was likely unleavened, because that was what was common back then. But in the Greek East, they used leavened bread, bread like we would see today that has had yeast in it to make it rise during the bakery. Now, this, of course, also causes theological differences. And the final split eventually... in We've been leading up to all this. We've had political turmoil between the Pope and the religious... Con authorities in Constantinople and the emperor, and we have some theological differences that are developing as well. And the final split finally comes to a head in the 11th century, in 1054. In 1053, the pope declares that the former Byzantine churches in southern Italy are that have recently come under Norman control. The Normans are also the ones that invaded England. The Normans kind of come down to Italy, and they see southern Italy from the Byzantines. And you have all these new churches that are now and the Normans are Christian themselves and follow the Pope. They follow the Pope as their religious leader. So the Pope decrees that all these former Byzantine churches, Byzantine Greek churches that are be still practicing the Eastern Orthodox rites, that they must either convert to the Latin rites of the West, or they will be forced to close. This ticks off the, Byzant the Byzantine religious officials in the East, the Orthodox religious officials. And the Patriarch of Constantinople, Michael Sir Sir Cerularius, he ends up in retaliation for this demand by the Pope that the Byzantine churches in southern Italy have to either convert to Latin rites or close. In retaliation, he closes all Latin churches in Constantinople and says, okay, if you're going to close my churches in southern Italy because they're practicing their rites their way, I'm going to close the ones over here in Constantinople that are practicing your rites.
and this makes it worse. In 1054, the, a year after this, the Pope sends a legation to Constantinople to demand that the Patriarch must recognize the Pope as the head of the Christian Church. Basically, the Pope is making a power grab at this point. He recognizes that the Patriarch is a threat to his authority, and he tries to say, I'm the top authority here, not you, so I don't care what you say, what I say is what goes. So the Pope pretty much sends this to the Patriarch in Constantinople and says that you need to recognize that I am the ultimate authority in the Christian Church. The Patriarch and the Emperor both are not having this. And they have, at this point, they're fed up with the Pope, they're fed up with the West, and the Patriarch, so so Serularius, he actually refuses to even meet with the legation because of the demand that he has received prior to the legation's arrival, and he outright refuses to even meet with them over this matter. In response, the Cardinal of Cardinal Humbert uh, Silva Can Candida, who is the main head of the legation sent by the Pope, he heads to the Hagia Sophia, the main Byzantine church in Constantinople, the main Orthodox church that had been built by Justinian the Great, Justinian the First, and had been the head of the Orthodox Church ever since. He heads there, and right on the altar of the Hagia Sophia, the Cardinal of Candida actually places a letter of excommunication on the altar of the Hagia Sophia against the Patriarch of Constantinople. Excommunication basically means that you are officially no longer a member of this church, you are officially kicked out. You're removed from the church. Go. You're no longer part of this church. You're you're not a member. Kick, you're kicked out. That's pretty much a fancy way of saying you're kicked out. <laughs> but he excommunicates the Patriarch of Constantinople. In response, Cellularius, he responds by excommunicating Cardinal Humbert of Silva Canada. He excommunicates the cardinal. <laughs> and he does this with the consent of the emperor, of emperor Constantine the Ninth. The emperor is fully backing behind the patriarch's decision. He and he and officially they also declare that they are no longer adherent to the pope in Rome, that they will no longer follow him and this is what is known as the final schism. This is the final separation between the east and west when the east and the west finally go their separate ways. The west tries to overextend its authority a little bit and the east equally not wanting to accept that authority basically say okay yeah, I'm so the West kicks them out and the East says, Okay, fine, I'm gonna kick you out too. You're not you're not part of our church anymore either. And the East kind of says that we are no longer having anything to do with you. And the West pretty much says the same thing. So this marks the split that happens in ten fifty four. That the West is now under the under the leadership of the Pope and they adhere to their Christian rights and they really have very little to do with the rights of the Eastern Orthodox Church in the East, who is led by the Patriarch and the Byzantine Emperor. In the century, now, there would continue to be troubles here for a couple centuries after this Great Schism. I mean, tensions were still high between the East and West, and they ultimately culminated throughout the Crusades with the Fourth Crusade in 1204 that was supposedly going to help liberate the Holy Land, but instead they go and attack and sack Constantinople and actually break up the Byzantine Empire for a few decades until the Byzantines can manage to regain control of their own territory again. And this, grad this very much weakens the Byzantines to the point that even though they eventually regain their sovereignty, they never really had the power that they once did, and in 1453, Constantinople falls to the Ottoman Empire, and is no longer the headquarters of the Orthodox Church, and because Mus becomes Muslim. The Orthodox Church largely goes to Russia as the new major Orthodox kingdom in the East. Now, in the centuries that followed, the East and West continued to really not have anything to do with each other. They, the split had happened. Whether they wanted to, whether the, some people in their two respective camps wanted to reunify was a different matter. In the eyes of the Pope and the Patriarch, the split had occurred due to the other's incompetence. And it remained this way for centuries. And in fact, relations have only recently somewhat gotten better. And this happened in 1965 when the excommunications of 1054 on the part of the Patriarch and the Card Card Cardinal of Canada officially were repealed by both the Pope and the Patriarch in an attempt to 
end the excommunication and try to establish some kind of better relations with the other. Relations are better today than they were, but the churches really don't have a whole lot of relation with each other. They do take part at times in cooperative rituals and cooperative rites during certain fest church holidays and festivities, but they really still are quite divided, and this has remained the way to this day. So if you go to like Greece, you go to Eastern Europe, like Ukraine, Belarus, Russia, Turkey, Greece, there is still a large number of Eastern Orthodox Christians there. Where you go to the West, like even here in the United States, which is considered part of the West, you go to France, Spain, England, Germany, Austria, Italy, you will find many Catholics, many of those that appear to the West. And of course, many mo all the Protestant branches break off from the Catholic Church, so they're also part of those Western churches. But this divide is important because this really, this has never ended. It's still ongoing today. We still have an Eastern Orthodox Church and a Western Roman Catholic Church. We still have an East and West divide in Christianity that has continued ever since and has not ended. And it's hard to think that it was over a thousand years ago pretty much that this happened. Now we do have a few pictures, and this one is just kind of a map of the Byzantine Empire at its height, the Eastern Roman Empire at the during Justinian's reign in 555, about almost 80-some years after the fall of the West, where you can see that they have regained Italy from the Western Empire, because this would mark like the boundary of the old Eastern Empire. Anything east of this was the Eastern Roman Empire. So all this was still theirs. They had to retake like these lands in western North Africa from the Vandals. They had to retake these in Spain, what would be Spain. All of Italy they managed to retake. But we also point out here that the Franks would be up here eventually. The Lombards would take this when the crisis came in 800. And we have the four churches that used to be. We have Rome there. Constantinople right there, which today is known as Istanbul. Antioch over here, which was taken by the Muslims in the seventh, sixth and seventh centuries, and then we have right seventh and eighth centuries, and then we have Alexandria there in Egypt. These two were lost when the Muslims took them. Did I demonstrate where those were? Here we have a picture of the Hagia Sophia, the Church of Holy Wisdom in Istanbul slash Constantinople today. And the four towers were added by the Ottomans during their rule. It's part of the, it was converted to a mosque. It, I think it recently just got reconverted to a mosque. From, it was a museum for a number of years, but they just reconverted it again. I don't know if you can still go to Turkey and see it, like inside, if unless you're a Muslim. But they added these four towers. So the original church is the structure in the center. This was built by the Byzantines, and this was the main. Christian Eastern Orthodox Church, and this was the same church that the first excommunication letter from the Cardinal of Canada to the Patriarch, where he excommunicated the Patriarch, he went inside this church and he put, put it right on the altar. And then here we have a mosaic that is inside that church that kind of depicts just a Byzantine art, but it depicts two very important figures that we discussed. In the center we have Mary and baby Jesus, and then over here we have Emperor Constantine I, the first Christian emperor of Rome, hand, handing the city of Constantinople to Mary and Jesus. Well, over here we have what is supposed to be Emperor Justinian handing the Church of Hagia Sophia to her. But that basically, I think, concludes the video for today. I just wanted to hit a topic that was a little bit older than what we're probably used to. And it was just a little bit more out there instead of constantly staying with the presidents or more recent history of the last 300 years. So just something to kind of get out of the way and something that could be going back just a little further than what we're typically used to. So that concludes for this video. I don't know what the next video will be yet. I don't know when I'll have that out. Hopefully it will be here very soon. At least I'm hoping to. I'm hoping to get back on a somewhat regular schedule, but we'll see what happens here. But I just wanted to go ahead and get a video done today for the sake of it, just because I know I hadn't done one in a while. And I didn't want to leave all the people just kind of wondering what was going on. <laughs> but we will hopefully be getting our videos out here again here soon, now that summer's coming to an end and stuff's winding down. So that will hopefully occur.
So as always, if you have any questions or comments, be sure to put them down in the comment section down below. If you're wa liking the videos that have been coming out or you find yourself actually coming back and watching some of them as they're getting announced when they're coming out, be sure to subscribe or something in case we put something on here that might spike your interest. I'm not saying that you're going to like every one of them, of course. But you never know. And of course, any suggestions for any future videos, I mean, right now would be a perfect time. But if you have any, put that down in the comment section below and I'll probably look into it. But as always, I think this is, wraps it up for right now. So hopefully everyone has a good rest of their week and may God bless you all.